The Life of Joseph, From Criminal to Vizier, on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Today we are talking about the later life of Joseph. And if you like these videos and wish to help out, please hit that subscribe button. It's really important to us. And if you wish to help us financially, please consider becoming a Patreon member. Okay, we are going to talk about today the life of Joseph and the latter life, part of his life, from when he's in prison until he becomes vizier over all of Egypt. Now, when we talk about the vizier of Egypt, we're talking about the highest office in Egypt besides the king itself. But we have to take a step back to his time in prison where he becomes an interpreter of dreams. Because this is what gets him out of prison ultimately, is that Joseph becomes a very accomplished dream interpreter. Now, we don't find the interpretation of dreams used much in Hebrew literature. It is there. We do sometimes see dreams being interpreted in Hebrew literature, but it's usually in in relation to Israelites that meet with other foreigners. Now, in the case of interpreting dreams in ancient Egypt, this is an important cultural reference. We find that the Egyptians place a high value on the interpretation of dreams and the meaning of dreams. And it's something that really, really resonated with Egyptian culture. We find, for example, a dream interpretation book amongst the ancient Egyptian texts, Papyrus Chester B.D. 3, sometimes called the Dream Book. And it's a papyrus that lists, is just a list of various interpretations of dreams. And to give you an, a, a sample of some of these interpretations from the Chester Beatty papyrus, it begins with, if a man sees himself. That's the beginning of the papyrus. And then it gets gives you the sort of if he sees himself doing some X. For example, if he sees himself sawing wood, and then it gives you the interpretation, good, his enemies are dead. If he sees himself burying an old man, good, it means prosperity. Bringing in cattle, good, the assembling of people for him by his God. But there's also bad interpretations. Okay? If a man sees himself drinking warm beer, it's hard to believe that drinking any beer could be bad, but it's bad. It means suffering will come upon him. If in a dream a man sees himself eating an egg, bad, the seizure of his possessions beyond repair. And if a man sees himself pressing out wine, bad, because it means the taking away his possessions. Now, this one is very interesting because we also, in the dream of the cupbearer, the cupbearer squeezes wine into the cup of Pharaoh. And Joseph interprets that as a good dream. But we see in Chester B.D. Papyrus, it's interpreted as a bad dream, as a bad omen. So there's this, there's this very interesting sort of dissonance between what Joseph interprets and what is common interpretation in Egyptian culture. And even today, dreams still have a strong influence amongst modern Egyptians. So it's an, it's an important 
set of portents and signs even today. Now, when Joseph was remembered by the cupbearer after the king had his troubling dreams, he's brought before the king, and the king dreamt of seven fat cows and seven ugly starving cows. And the starving cows ate the fat cows. And Joseph said, the dream predicts seven years of feast and seven years of famine. Genesis 41, 26. Now, the symbols of fat and ugly cows in Genesis 41, 17 to 19 are something that can still be seen at, the, at temples like at Medina Habu where there are reliefs of fat cows, very fat cows. Moreover, the productivity of the land of Egypt could be predicted by the height of the flood. And the Egyptians had these devices known as nilometers. Now, a nilometer is a special kind of well built near the river that measured the height of the annual flood and it was used primarily for taxation. If the flood was high that year, there'd be a bumper crop, and they could tax more. But if the height of the Nile was low, it meant famine and starvation. And this was a really important predictor for whether a crop would be good or bad. So, presumably, at the time of Joseph, they had seven years of high flood and then seven years of low flood. Now, famine in Egypt was not unique to the time of Joseph. And it did occur when rain levels in East Africa were too low to cause the annual inundation. And when this happened in Egypt, it was often called the meeting of the banks because the water level was so low that in some places, one could cross the Nile on foot. And this actually had a really dramatic effect upon the Egyptian culture because we have to remember that Egypt is a river nation. It's not just dependent upon the river for food and water. It's also dependent upon the river for transportation. Products in Egypt were primarily moved by ship. There weren't paved roads that went from the length of Egypt. Most of the produce and product of Egypt was moved by boat. So without the river and without the river being navigable, you couldn't move things to and from the places they needed to get to in Egypt. So this was really, really important that Egypt had a constant water supply. Now, as a result of Joseph's efforts, Joseph was given the highest position in the land after the king, Genesis 41.40. This position was known as the vizier. And depending upon the period of time, Egypt could have one or two viziers. Now, we know from the text that Joseph was the only vizier, being the highest in the land after Pharaoh. So this places Joseph's tenure to before Egypt's new kingdom. Because when the new kingdom starts... Akmosa I appoints two viziers, one over Lower Egypt, one over Upper Egypt. But before then, there was only one vizier. Now, it is often asked, how could a notoriously xenophobic people like the Egyptians make someone like Joseph, who's a Semitic Asiatic, a vizier? Well, there are actually two other times in history that the Egyptians promoted a Semite to become vizier. First was under King Akhenaten, the vizier Aper-El, 
who was an Asiatic. But also later on, under Seti II, we have the Vizier Bey. So there are other historical parallels where, say, the xenophobic Egyptians appointed a Semite to be an Asiatic, to be Vizier. The other factor we have to take into account is that at the time when Joseph entered Egypt, the country was controlled by the Hyksos. Now, the Hyksos were Amorite Asiatics that settled in the Nile Delta during the 11th dynasty and inhabited the city of Avaris. When the Theban kings of Dynasty 13 lost control of Egypt, the Hyksos filled the power vacuum. Now, culturally speaking, the Hyksos were very similar to the sons of Jacob, both being Semitic Asiatic in origin. Early Hyksos burials were used Semitic-style tombs. And they, both cultures used Amoritic imperfective names. They both spoke a Northwestern Semitic Canaanite dialect. In addition, the Hyksos also worshipped Canaanite deities such as Baal, Astarte, and Reshef. Furthermore, even though the Hyksos enculturated themselves to Egyptian customs, they also practiced defilement of Egyptian tombs and monuments. So, the Hyksos kind of weren't exactly true blood Egyptians in culture. And they used their power and influence to harshly tax the local Egyptians, but they regarded other Asiatics as culturally similar. So the idea of Joseph becoming vizier is at least possible. Now, besides being vizier, Joseph was also awarded a chain of gold. Genesis 41, 42. Now, this is really interesting because the chain of gold was one of the highest honors in, in ancient Egypt. It's sort of the Egyptian equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's the highest honor in the land. We see the chain of gold being awarded to other viziers and generals in Egypt, such as Aparel. Even Horemheb receives a chain of gold, as does General Akmosa, son of Abana. So this is a very, very prestigious honor. Joseph also rides a chariot twice in Genesis 41-43 and 46-29. In Genesis 41-43, Joseph rode in a second chariot beside the king and the text tells us that Joseph was set over all the land of Egypt. Now, the chariot was first introduced in Egypt by the Hyksos during the Second Intermediate Period. Now, we have to understand that before the Hyksos, the Egyptians didn't have chariots or even horses that were suitable for warfare. The native Egyptian wild horse was very frail, had a very frail back, and wasn't suitable for riding or for chariot use. What the Hyksos do is they import with them chariots and horse breeding stock that are interbred with the Egyptian wild horse to produce this sort of long, lanky horse that's at least suitable for use with a chariot. And we see at Avaris the first true horse burials in Egypt. We also find the first references to chariots in second intermediate period documents. 
And now, in Genesis 41-45, Joseph takes Asenath to be his wife. And she is the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. Now, this is a very important and interesting geographical reference. On is the Hebrew transliteration of the Egyptian city Ianu, which is better known as Heliopolis. And Heliopolis is a famous cult site in Egypt. It's the cult site of the Egyptian god atum Re, and goes all the way back to the Third Dynasty of Egypt. The architect Imhotep, the famous architect that that built the, the Step Pyramid of Zoser. He's the first high priest of On, of Heliopolis. So it's got a long, illustrious history in Egypt as a cult site. Genesis 47.20, the passage that mentions the famine in Egypt, also mentions Joseph's scheme to purchase all the land for the king. Now, this is very interesting, too, because this is also a fact that is confirmed in Egyptian records. From the tomb of Mosa, scribe of Ta, we learn that King Akmosis drove out the Hyksos and that the land was redistributed to those who had served in the army. You don't redistribute land unless it was priorly owned by someone else. In this case, the king. So the land monopoly was broken up at the beginning of the new kingdom. But Joseph positioned the Hyksos kings to control all the land under their dominion. And that dominion stretched from the Mediterranean coast all the way down to Kusay, which was near Asut in Middle Egypt. And after the death of Joseph, the Hyksos plundered the land of Egypt. And they heavily taxed the Thebans by this sort of divided split pressure. The Hyksos had formed an alliance with the Cushite kingdom in the land of Cush. So what they did was they squeezed the Theban province. The Hyksos were never able to conquer the Thebans. But what they did was they applied pressure. They had the Cushites from the south put military pressure from the south, while they put military pressure from the north. So they squeezed the the Thebans from both sides. In exchange for easing off the pressure, they extracted tribute. So it was a coordinated attempt to keep the Thebans under their thumb without going through the bother of conquering it. Now the Hyksos established their capital city at, at Avaris, which is Tel El Daba. And the sons of Jacob were given the land surrounding the city so that they could be close to Joseph. Genesis 45.10 and that's an important fact, that Joseph wanted his kin close by. And not only that, his kin were given the best the land of Egypt. Now, if you go to Tel El Daba today, basically that land that surrounds the ancient cities of Avaris and Paramses, it's very fertile. Even today, it's some of the most fertile land in Egypt. And it remains the best of the land. So we've got a pretty good idea where the land of Goshen was. It was in the, the, the territory surrounding the cities of Avaris and Paramses. Upon Joseph's death, his body was mummified and buried in a tomb in Egypt. Genesis 50, 26. 
Now, mummification is a distinctly Egyptian custom. Joseph also had the body of his father, Jacob, mummified. Now, regarding Jacob's mummification, we are told that they fulfilled 40 days according to the custom of mummification and that the Egyptians took 70 days to mourn. Genesis 50, verse 3. Now, what's actually being told here is is that the minimum requirement for mummification was that the body was covered and buried, essentially buried in natron. It was heap, natron was heaped on the body to desiccate the body for 35 to 40 days. But the extent of that, that, that mummification process could take up to 70 days. So, the process of drying out the body in natron was something that took usually between 35 and 70 days, but no more than 70. After 70, that process was stopped, and the body was treated with oils and spices to, and perfume to, to give the body some fragrance, wrapped up, and then buried. So what we're seeing in this passage in Genesis 50 is an accurate reflection of the Egyptian custom of mummification. So that wraps up, excuse the pun, the life of Joseph. He ends life as a mummy. Uh, But it's a very interesting little detail that we would only expect from an Egyptian narrative. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this insight into the life of Joseph, and I hope you learned something, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.